Welcome everybody to this talk. Uh, I'm really happy that so many came. I have a star competition next door, so uh, I know I wish I could go to see Kevin and myself, but I'm glad you're here, see me. Um, I'm Tron Jortland. I'm not gonna tell you to ask you to pronounce it correctly, because I'm from Norway and those names are a bit tricky. Um, but, uh, and uh, I'm a bit of a newbie here. That's my um, first time talking outside of Norway. My first talk in English, really. And uh, I've done a couple of talks before in conferences in Norway, but those are more technical. So this is the first time on a proper DDD conference, which I really enjoy. And I want first a shout out to Marco and the Kandinsky team for first, for doing this, for doing a DDD conference. It's really cool. And for having newbies like me here. Yeah, that's really cool. All right, let's start with the, with the title here, which is rather compounded. Uh, you understand why I used that word later on, but let's start with the with what was in there, because the summary is exactly in the title. So I'm going to talk about capabilities, those enigmatic business capabilities, and what they can be used for, because their utility is quite extensive. And in the title it says, from capabilities to services, so this is going to be not as much a domain-driven design talk, more of service-oriented architecture talk. But I feel they overlap, they, uh, they complement each other a lot of times, and even as I said, overlap. <clears throat> and also going to talk about, of course, modeling. That's why we all are here, I suppose. So I'm talking to the choir when I say it in the, when I want to raise the importance of modeling. And uh, we want to achieve business IT uh, alignment. That has been a big thing from service oriented architecture, architecture from the beginning. Uh, but there are things that might help us to create that, and those are the capabilities. So I hope to communicate that. Yes. All right. But first, a little bit about modeling. I know I'm speaking to the choir, but I'll let you read this if you haven't seen it before. Yeah, you know, we, we tend to run to the solution space too quickly, I think. And we should spend more time modeling and use the models for what they can be used for. For example, um, as Julie Lerman said earlier, that you, and you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't um, get married to one model. You should have many models, even competing models. Because you should treat, uh, on my perspective, is that you shouldn't treat models as your pets, but your cattle. This is similar to, 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 to the uh, server size, uh, server uh, uh, metaphor, if you like. So, um, and I have always enjoyed this uh, from, from the very beginning. I've always enjoyed digging down and uh, analyzing stuff. Um, I come from a science background. And I did a thesis in astrophysics, of all things. So I'm not a trained uh, IT person, but I love analysis. I love digging into problems. And IT is a good place for that. So, so let's get into the core of this talk, which is these business capabilities. Um, I'm not going to say what they are yet. I'm going to keep you in suspense for a little bit more while. But um, I want to... Um, I want you to, to understand why I'm presenting them here. It's not like it, that's going to be a, a new way of doing stuff. It's going to be revolutionary. It's going to be another tool in your toolbox. Right? You have, here you have um, a lot of uh, the talks on story, uh, storytelling, or domain storytelling. There are uh, event storming, there is context mapping, and there's ent entity lifecycle analysis, there's value chain analysis, and business process modeling. The list goes on and on and on. But this can be another tool in your toolbox, I think. And also, uh, a lot of these tools, they differ if they are bottom-up or top-down. I want to be clear at the beginning, this is very much top-down. Even I would go as far as say it's more outside-in than top-down. Hopefully I'll be able to convey that later, what I mean by that. And also, business capabilities are not, not, nothing new. You, by the way, how many have heard of them before? Not that many who, who feel that they know what they are. <laughs> Half a hand here and there. Yeah, that's the thing. This is not new. This goes back to the 60s, as many things as we do today. And it's prevalent in the enterprise architecture space. How many have done an enterprise architecture here? Tool? I suspected none. <laughs> or the ones that said, hmm, it's also the same that said they knew a little bit about business capabilities. They come from that space. 
Sorry? I went away. You went away from here. <laughs> yeah, some people do that because uh, you get into the IBR architecture thing quite quickly in there. But I think that we have, we have actually something to learn from those people. And I'm not one of them. I had some time in my career, I was an IT architect working with the enterprise architecture group. But I wasn't sort of in there in the midst, if you like. I was their IT alibi, if you like. Yeah. So, but keeping that in mind, it's not in you, so it's not fancy. So, as, as many of you know, um, we as human species, we like to learn through stories and metaphors. So I'm going to do a little bit of both. Does anybody know this? This is very Norwegian, by the way. This is from a Norwegian fairy tale called Sore Moe Castle, Palace. Yeah. That's a very Norwegian, but so. So I, I'm going to take on a journey from where I started as a noob or a novice in IT in general. As I said, I come from science, which is not really IT or astrophysics. And I wanted to reach the Sore Moe Castle, which is in the horizon there. So I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey, what I've learned along the way. And me standing here um, is more or less uh, trying to convey to you what I've learned. And also by doing teaching, I also learn better. I teach, I learn better by teaching it, like Richard Feynman said. So my story begins in, well, I started my career in 1999, <clears throat> but I got really into IT in early 2000, and I encountered the book, the blue book, in 2004. You see, it's, and that's my copy, it's even signed. So I went to a one-day workshop with Ray Gammons in Oslo. And somebody, I'm not saying, no, I'm not going to name them names, but I worked on a team. And I, as I said, I was a novice then. Used the Dreyfus model, I was a beginner. So I, when I say we, I say collectively, we started using domain domain design. So some architect decided that, okay, we should create a new software architecture for this middleware platform. And we're going to use every pattern there is in this book. Or first half, of course. Mm -hmm. right? So this is what some people call DD light. I, and I agree with Julie, it's not a great term. But that's what we did. And to be it worse, not only did we do that, we did it everywhere. And remember, as I said, this was a middleware platform. And what does middleware platform really do? A lot of crud. Right. So we had domain models for things that we read from another system, create a model, which was not ours, because the system was the source of truth, and yeah, the maintenance uh, was horrible. So this was more or less like a domain driven design car crash. Sad to look back on, but I learned a lot from it. So maybe I, I advanced from being a novice then, and maybe work myself into competence at some level, but yeah. Uh, do you, I'm going to use the Dreyfus model a bit here. Do you are familiar with the Dreyfus model? Dreyfus learning acquisition model? Dreyfus said there are ways you can learn stuff. Do you go through phases, if you like? You start as a novice, and as a novice, you need guidelines. Patterns are really good at novices, right? So we run to patterns because they are easy to understand, and you just do what you're told, basically. And then you go into competence, and then you move into, you need goals. You're more free. And, uh, and you, you start to think on your own now. And you also combine uh, patterns from different areas and stuff like that. And then you move into proficient. And then you're more into metaphors. Uh, you like stories, right? We, people here probably more in that category. Experts, which actually works on philosophies instead. And arguments, they argue with other professionals and create new ideas. At this point, I was definitely a novice. I was nervous at programming even, so yeah. I was just studying Java, I think, this year. And then, 2008, some of the people who's um, been meddling with the EI space probably knows this platform. This is the classical, large, gigantic ES ESB. So somebody at the company I worked on at that time decided we needed a middleware platform that could serve everyone. So here we go with them. Then centralized the ESP with the canonical data model and everything. I was starting to get into SOA at this point. But this SOA is uh, what I refer to as classical SOA. It's the very web, web services focus, really technical. Thomas Earle, if you know him, I've written a lot of books about it. <clears throat> but I was here, I was a novice at SOA. Then I went to this brilliant course. 
I'm not working for uh, particular software or anything, but this course, if you get the chance, take it. This was a game changer for me as a professional. I moved from being a novice to almost feeling like an expert at this point. It changed a lot for me. Do you familiar with Udata Han? Those, those in the net.net probably do a lot of nothing. So this advanced distributed system design using SOA and DDD. So then, oh, so that was a sort of discovery. One thing I rediscovered to my driven science at a certain point. Got a new perspective of it. I learned about ubiquitous language, about bounded context and strategic design and everything. So I moved into being a more competent domain driven design at this point. But the sober bit, he changed everything. He turned it upside down. <clears throat> what I thought I knew about SOA and the ESBs and all that, he threw it out. That's not SOA. And he comes from a .NET perspective, so that's probably why. Because uh, after I've, I've come back to that later on, I started digging, and it seems that Microsoft has a different perspective of SOA than a lot of Java people do. You still have ESP, but not as dramatic. As I always. And then, I believe I saw this in 2013. This is the presentation by Fred George, where he presented what he called Microsoft with a dash, by the way. Not the... Oh, someone's calling me. No, wait. My son. Um, and uh, as I said, I saw this in 2013, uh, but I think this presentation is from 2012. And also notice what he says there. I, I didn't recognize that bef before. Uh, stop calling me. <laughs> um, and also, James Lewis was doing talks, or at least papers, at the, or blog posts, more like, in 2012. And he, he also brought up a term that I heard earlier in the Udi Han course, and that was business capabilities. He was talking about business capabilities. He was also talking about Conway's Law, which we all love and know now. And James Lewis, by the way, he was the, the <laughs> it's a funny bit. Uh, he said that he wanted code so small that it could fit in his head. Not fit in his head, but he could understand it all. And then start, people start to use his head as a size measure for the code, how many lines of code. <laughs> he, that's what, not, not what he meant. He meant that he should understand. They have a complete understanding of this domain, if you like, service. So the business capabilities, and that came back to this uh, quote by Judith Hahn, which he used in the course that I mentioned earlier. A service is the technical authority of, for a specific business capability. The capability again. When I did the course, I didn't really understand what business capability was. I just, okay, whatever it is. I focused on the service bit. Right? So, okay, uh, uh, James Lewis was mentioning business capabilities. And also a colleague of mine who was working in the ES space mentioned capabilities. So I think hmm, maybe I should start digging a little bit here. So I did. Uh, first I came across was this. Uh, it's a free book from InfoQ, by the way. It's written in 2006 by Steve Jones. I think it was for Capgemini. I did not then and probably do it now. A Brit, as far as I know. He described something how or he, he described a way to create a service architecture. Let's call it there. And, that's a, and he described a process he called four-step program for SOA. I'll get back to that later on. But the important bit there was that you should, when, you, when you model the, your business, and I'm not talking about small domains, the whole business, you should focus on, start by focusing on the what. What does the business do? Why do they do it? And how do they do it? Wait with the how. No, sorry, uh, who is doing it? Wait with the how. And here we'll go back to this problem space and solution space again, right? Keep off the how for now. Understand your domain first, or your problem space. So that, I managed to understand that because of the DDD, basically. So that helped me understand what he was talking about. And as they get digging more, this is from, um, I'm not sure, oh, this is the paper by, by uh, Holman and Toby in 2006. This is, I started digging into MSDN, for those who know it, Microsoft's Development Network. There's a lot of good articles there. Unfortunately, these articles are gone now because they started deleting them. But I kept, I kept the copy, so I have it if somebody wants it. But here they discussed what a service is in, 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 in relation to functions and components. And here you see the services are way different from what, uh, what the ESBs were promoting. Services are a component. They are they're bigger things. They, all, they contain data, they contain components, they contain functions, they interact with events. These are what the services Microsoft was talking about. Yes. 
And in those papers, especially one, I um, don't have a slide for it, but it says business capability mapping, staying ahead of the Joneses. It's a great title, by the way. So business capability mappings is the differentiator, 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 sorry, uh, for a business that you understand your whole domain. That puts you ahead of a lot of other companies, especially big enterprises that it's, it's not coordinated properly. So, and in, that, in those papers, they clearly state capabilities provide services. So the services are what the capabilities contain, if you like. I'm not sure if you're still getting the grasp of capabilities. Are we getting there? Bear with me. And then later on, the open group, which is famous for TOGAS. Again, for those who are familiar with EA, <laughs> no, uh, I wouldn't recommend anyone to use it, but you can pick up parts. And one part is business capabilities. They, uh, they, call it, they don't call it the same, they call it business capability-based planning. So they use it for planning, not necessarily for modeling, no, but for planning. And there are some quotes from a quite recent paper from 2016, where somebody clearly saw the other use of, of capabilities. This is, a business capability represents the ability for a business to do something. Quite vague, but still. You see, it's not a thing anymore. And it's not a function, it's a, an ability to do something, all right? Another quote, a business capability is a particular ability or capacity that a business may possess or change to achieve a specific purpose or outcome. It's based on outcomes, by the way, right? Not outputs, which is good. So this is, uh, you can think of yourself, um, <laughs> without making this magic, business capabilities, think of it, you have capabilities to do stuff, right? You have capabilities to create art, for example. You have capabilities to, to do the, design the perfect IT system or the perfect domain model. You've you got abilities to do stuff, right? This is what capabilities are. It's, uh, somebody even claimed that a com competence would actually be a better word. But capabilities is what we use, though. And put, move that into business. What is it that the business do, can do, provide to others? And those are implemented as services. You get examples later on if this gets tricky. Just a little sidestep because it's, I find it relevant, uh, maybe because it's part of my journey. I started getting to the system thinking. This was in the last year actually, first I first discovered that. And then you, see the, uh, then you see the need to see things holistically. We tend to uh, break down things into smaller bits and focus on those and ignore the whole, which can... <laughs> which can lead into big problems, because you miss the, 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 the overview, you miss the connection that that part has to others. And, and uh, a system thinking, uh, a quick summary of system thinking is that the parts may be, may be simple, but the system as a whole could be complex. Right? I think it was Russell Lakoff, I'm going to read it so I don't misquote him. He says, system, uh, system is not a sum of, of, uh, of the behavior of its parts, is the product of its interactions. You see? So if we focus on simple domains and ignore the rest, we're missing big parts. As Kenny said earlier, with the tools, you have your blind spots. You could miss, miss important blind spots. And then last year, I had the pleasure of watching Dave Snowden, that oh, last this year actually, uh, time flies, in January. Dave Snowden talked about uh, complex adaptive system at the uh, domain design, uh, uh, domain driven design Europe. And after that, I've, I've heard about the Kinevin model before, because I've seen talks by Liz Keogh and others, but I've never sort of digged into it. And after that, I watched all presentations or read everything I can come across by Dave Snowden. And this is my current obsessive interest. Hope to learn some from it. And. Um, an important part here, as I said, I haven't really gotten too much into it yet, but there's, there's, some, there's talk about uh, reductionism and emergence. Uh, me with a science background, I'm very used to reductionism. There is this belief that you can break things down into the minute part and then build it up again, and it would be a line, linear connection between them. In quantum physics, is that. But like quarks, you can understand, if you understand quarks, you can understand how people think, is the idea. 
there's a different camp who say that no, 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 you can't, because there's something called emergence. And this is from com complex uh, thinking now. So like, uh, for example, life, that's an uh, emergent property of chemistry. It's not, there's not a direct link. Um, from my um, background, as I said then, mass and space and time, it is here because it's an emergent property of Higgs and string theory, for example. Those are familiar with those terms. So a domain can be very complex. We, uh, as long as people are involved, things is complex. You can't get away from that. Uh, yes, your software may not be complex, and I think we overuse the term complex when we say software. We think we, works in com we may create complex software. In this definition, we don't. It's complicated. Because there's a linear connection. When you do stuff in something to that system, you can predict what's, what, what's coming out of the other side. You can, analyze, you can analyze it, right? For a complex system, you can't. You can only probe it, you can test it, you can poke it and see what happens. And when you do it that twice, the outcome could be different. There's no linearity. Well, yes, I'm going to spend more time, but it's very fascinating. Uh, but, oh, sorry, I'm going to end with a quote from Snowden here. You understand a complex system by in interacting with it, as I said, poking it, not by analyzing or modeling it. Does that make you think? What do we do here? We try to model stuff, don't we? And it, it's fine, but it can easily lead you down the wrong path. So don't get too touched with your models. Create a lot of models, competing models, and test them. That's how you can find your way in a complex system. Which is complex as long as there's human involved. Remember that. All right. So a, a short, I'm going to be quick. Here, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the business IT alignment, what I mean by that. It's a bit cheesy, but still. Um, it's a good one. It, it conveys the idea, though. You have the business and your IT. They should be joined together. It shouldn't be separate. It shouldn't be us and them. It should be us. That's the alignment bit. And I like to think of it as like an easy change in business should be an easy change in IT. If it isn't, you have a large amount of extensive complexity. Of course, and change and change in IT could be complex and hard, but then it's, of course there is this IT as well. But then it's the inherent complexity that is the reason, not the accidental that you create it because you create massive systems or whatever. And also, you need to create an IT system that's evolvable that is able to absorb, absorb change well. And uh, uh, a lot of people talk about when you create architecture, you should, uh, uh, architecture is creating options for yourself in the future. So that is how evolvable your architecture is, that it can accept or absorb change in the future. Um, this is from another brilliant paper that you was on the MSDN network. I came across that after I had the course with you done, by the way. EDA, so what through the looking glass, great paper. As a, uh, it's also been deleted, but I think UD has a copy of it on his page. But here it illustrates the disconnection between, if you don't have a high alignment with IT, you have an app, two apps, and they serve two different domains. There's always going to be contention and inertia and problems with that. A change there would affect all, both apps, for example. Okay, so alignment. Ideally, this is a perfect picture though, would be like this. And since you are so a driven guy, those are called services. But from, for your domain driven design, that could easily be domains. So this is, you, you all know this, right? This is what domain driven design is about. But yeah. Mm -hmm. So, the mapping bit. All right, no time, good. Um, I'm now gonna get into more on what the business capabilities are and how you find them, because they are not necessarily easy to find. As I said earlier, they are the what, not the how. And if you use the uh, Steve Jones model, it's not really about who and why either. Just start with the what. What, is, well, what are these things? So I, can be, uh, I looked up Wikipedia, they have a definition. It says, a capability is the ability to form or achieve a certain action or outcome. So. We already talked about this, so I don't know. But uh, one thing to remember here is that this is very structural. It doesn't say anything about movement or actions, or, because you need other models for that, but it's, it's, a, it's a static picture. And it's often hierarchical. You start with the, a few on the top and break it down to bits. 
Uh, yes. Um, I'm Nick this from uh, Bill Poole, another great set of blog posts that he did in 2008. He didn't call it business gap bills, he's called it value chain analysis, but it's pretty much the same. Uh, value, ana value chain analysis started, uh, it's an older concept, but uh, it's, it's similar to a business gap bills. So why would we choose those? Why is that so important? That's the question I'll try to answer here. Because they are stable, they are the most stable thing in, in your business, in your enterprise architecture, in, in your enterprise. You start with what does the business do? And from that, you can create business processes. And from that, you can create roles, responsibilities, and KPIs. And then organization. As we all know, organizations change all the time. Doesn't mean that the capabilities change. They actually never do, with their quotes. If they change, the business change, they pivot. Or they add a new capability, they try to do something new. Or they decide, okay, this doesn't work anymore, let's cancel it, which they, by the way, never do, because of some cost fallacy, but, fallacy, but still. So that's the idea. If you model around the most stable thing, you are in a much better place. So a capability, let's define it a bit. Then. <clears throat> it's stable, as I said. It's cohesive, it's not this classical term, but it's cohesive. It's self-contained. It's independent. You should be able to work on one capability without even really taking into account the others. But you should, as we said, with complex thinking, you should keep in mind. That, you know. And they are hierarchical, as I said. So they're building blocks of your business, basically. I have examples later on, so you can. But uh, what's important is that what they're not, they're just as important. They're not an apartment. As I showed earlier, if you do go by apartments, you, you choose something that's more f fragile or volatile than the business capabilities. It's not a business process. Business process goes often across these large, at least the high level uh, processes that go, goes across. And some of them, there's a lot of uh, also pro processes within them. But they are not the process on, on its own. It's not, definitely not a function. And it's not a data entity. Um, this is back to, uh, and I know uh, Udi talks a lot about this, that you shouldn't focus, you shouldn't model around entities. And, uh, and I think Michael Nigar and others have spoken about this recently. Modeling around data entities is an anti-pattern, he says. I tend to agree. And Udi says that you shouldn't, you shouldn't focus on the entities, you focus on the fields within that entity and see which fields belong together. That way you can, so it's not a data entity here either. So that helps in that world as well. And it's not necessarily an IT system. It can contain IT system, but also can it be manual. Well, yes, we work in IT and everything is not IT. There's a lot of manual processes. There are a lot of also physical machines and there's a lot of stuff that's a capabilities. It's not necessarily an IT system. So this is a lot more holistic. So it's defined, I'll come back to this later example of this, but it's defined by the people who work there and the stakeholders and the partners and the customers. It's defined by the processes they contain. It's defined by the information they own and the tools that are used. And the tools doesn't have to be, it can be IT systems, but it can also be uh, vehicles, it can be buildings, it can be whatever. We're talking outside IT here now, so yeah, of course. So uh, let's get into the modeling bit. Um, you're probably familiar with that, the stuff on the back there. That's uh, common in. Uh, in Durant Driven Design, all these uh, sticky notes. So uh, this is uh, a co collaborative working uh, thing. You, should, you, you shouldn't sit alone creating a business capability model. As you all know, you shouldn't create a model alone on your own either. So but, yeah, this is the same thing. Yeah. You should get people together to do this. So this is workshops you do with uh, central stakeholders. <coughs> so this, you get together as a set of people. Which people depends on the level you're working on. If you're working on the top level capabilities, I left them skip them ahead. If you work on the enterprise level, this, these are the top levels. And the top levels are about 10 ish. In a normal big enterprise, they're about 10. In large ones, they can be more, and in smaller enterprises, they can be less. On this level, you probably need the highest, the really expert the CEOs, maybe even C level people, or the business analyst, or something that really know the business from end to end. And then you start digging down into the next level, then you can uh, gather on another set of people, and you continue further down. How deep this goes, turtles all the way down, 
now, because at some level you, you are, you're going to encounter functions, because you can't, it's not a capability anymore. So you stop there. It, it doesn't make sense to go further down. So here's an example from um, uh, a presentation by Ulrich Kalek. I think he works, he's, uh, he's involved in Open Group now, I think. So this is just an example from his uh, presentation. I nicked it. Here's an example of a top level. He co uh, I think uh, Steve Jones called it level zero. I, I call it level one. But it's just top level. So you have something that works across, the, uh, something that some capability you need to run the business. This is uh, ACR and all that stuff. And you have support services, you have a product development example, you have delivery, you have market development, and oversight. I don't know what he meant by oversight, but probably monitoring, something like that. And then you can pick one and break it one level more. In market development, you have contract management, you have direct marketing, you have market analysis, and so on and so on. And you see this, there's a limited amount of these in this level. And that's actually, as I was thinking, this was probably simplistic, but I tried it a couple of times, and you end up with a similar uh, number of, 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 of uh, capabilities on each level. One example is from my work I did in Norway for um, the for public sector. This is labor and welfare administration. This is I didn't. This was not something we did uh, with the right people. So this is more my understanding of it. And one example I presented to them. They didn't take it further because I left just after. But here you have corporate manager again. I, they probably don't call it that, but it's similar. And assistive is um, uh, assistive tools that you need if you're disabled, for example. It help. You have social assistance. You have employment assistance. You have statistics, statistics that you deliver to your, com to your government, for example. You have pensions and yeah. And you break down employment assistance. You get another level. I'm not going to dig into these, but. Can affect photo if you like. This is more. This is work we did at the current client of mine. We actually did a collaborative working, not necessarily with the right people. We didn't get that far, but we started with IT and the IT architects. <coughs> so and they've been there for years, and one of them has been as soon as they started basically. So I think he knows a bit about how this business works. And then you have again poor corporate management, develop services. They have another one. The insight, they have finance, they build accesses. This is ISP, as I said. They deliver services to these, and they sell services. And the interesting thing by uh, internet service, by the way, is not this is not a value chain per se. This is a, something I uh, so something called a value network because it's, it's a large importance. Uh, a lot of important part is delivering the services. You keep the services for your customers. So that's why that's top level here. And you've got sales to come down your ongoing, in incoming sales, you've got sales efficiency, planning, yeah, and recommendations. Yeah, that's a lot. And also, I have tried to use recommendation that I think one was in one of the Microsoft uh, papers where they said, I try to write the names in a noun verb combination, like build access. So it's not called access, it's called build access, because then you give it some action, deliver services, and you know, that's a good heuristic, if you like. Yes, <clears throat> and documentation, you need that. So we use that for uh, the uh, welfare system that I mentioned earlier. So here's an example from the ISP though. There's a surface feasibility check. It's got a description, a short, concise description of what the capability is. And you got the components that I mentioned earlier, which are roles, processes that is supportive of this capability, information that it contains. You got networks and access types and all that and tools. The first one is an IT system, the other ones are more functions, if you like. Right. I hope I don't, didn't reveal any secrets on, on that business there, but it's, uh, you don't know what the business is, so yeah. Just an example. Uh, yes. So the utility, as I promised earlier, I, th I find that the utility of the, what you can use business capabilities for are bigger than you actually think. Because, ah, this is EA, this is something that the e enterprise architect do because they want to explain to the business what, mm -hmm. and yes, it is important part of it. This is business consulting when the IT or the in, in, in IT or enterprise architecture and in, in a non, non IT heavy uh, enterprise want to discuss with, with the business, then you use these terms. Common ubiquitous languages, if you like, on this level. You can use it for business analysis. 
the classical uh, priorities, initiatives that you do, gap analysis, what's um, cost benefits, and yeah, what, what capability costs more than they than they pay off and stuff like that. You can use it for strategic planning. You can say which part is strategic to us, what is core and what is generic, if you like. It's the same terms from domain driven design, by the way. And you use, you use often heat maps for that. An example of this is this one, this is a bomb. And that open group paper again. <clears throat> so here we have strategic core and supporting, which is similar to the three way uh, separation that we have in domain driven design. And you use the heat maps to say, okay, we're not good at marketing. We should get better at marketing. This is the way we lack. HR market management is not good at. We're good at operation management. We don't have to spend too much money there. And that way you can uh, set your strategies. It's a bit simplistic, um, and probably Simon Waldley would uh, kick me in the shin for it, on the shin for this, but it's a bit too simplistic. I wouldn't call it mapping even, but I'm breaking a bit of rules there. We're calling it mapping, but still. And that was the EI space. And here's the interesting bit I think we can take from this uh, in IT. You can use it for data management. You can say which information belongs where, which data belongs where. So it's master data management, if you like. I was missing anything here. Yep. And another one that I saw Liz Kayot mentioned, you can do it for sprint planning. <laughs> Moving from EA to sprint planning, and also a big leap, but you can use it for the... Um, say which part of your backlog should you prioritize now. You focus on that capability, because when you deliver those together, they belong together, because they are part of a cohesive whole. The capability is a cohesive whole. Mm. Nick? <laughs> I know you're a bit worried about this part, probably, but you can use it also to define your organization, your teams. And why there's a lot of people de debating this these days is this transition from project to products, right? Product mode instead of pro project mode. You deliver changes in, in, in uh, IT instead of using large projects, waterfall often, or waterfall with some scrum in between. Uh, you restructurize on products. And what are those products? You might ask, well, okay. Let's ask. This is from a, a blog post by Siriam Narayan, probably bit butchered his name, but uh, he says that product mode works best when the teams are organized to be simultaneously aligned with the business relevant capabilities and with enterprise architecture boundaries. Business capabilities again. You can use it for defining your teams, your product mode teams. And an interesting quote that I just noticed recently and made a connection that was just a couple of days ago. Without the former, they may lose alignment with the business, Goals. Without the latter, they lose on autonomy. Anybody heard about the autonomy alignment problem before? Henrik Nyberg. I, I maybe managed to say his name correctly. He's Swedish. He's, the, he's famous for the Spotify model, which you've probably heard of. Or he didn't create it, he just recorded what they did at Spotify at that time. And he's surprised as anybody that everybody copies the Spotify model. But in this uh, presentation or his videos, he, he, uh, he, ally, he's, um, he highlights the problem with when the team has, has neither high auto autonomy or high alignment. Like in the lower bit, which, which I usually worked in all my career, is that you have mic mic micromanaging organization but in different culture. No alignment, and there's no autonomy. Do what you're told. Right. And if you have a high autonomy, you can do whatever you like but they walk in every different direction, right? There's no, there's no alignment to the business strategy or to the, uh, yeah, to the, to the product uh, future and then the roadmaps and all, you know, you name it. And also on the line, if you have high alignment, but low autonomy, you have the command and control structure. Safe, if you like, as somebody mentioned earlier today, could work there. But you want to be in the top right, so this is a magical quote, but top left, Team knows they are aligned with the so that they know where they belong to that capability, for example. They know what's part of the strategic map they are, and they are autonomous to do whatever they want, product mode. Right. I think that was a brilliant insight uh, when I managed to, to join those two. Um, yes, um, the last one, which is probably 
really the, the, the main focus uh, of this talk, is the ability to use that capability map to design your architecture, if you like. How you split it up. What are your domains? What are your services? Since this is from SOA, this is well, how you can define what your services are. And you, you maybe even your bound context. I'm not saying bound context, but bound context is a, um, it's a, a dangerous term to use wrong. <laughs> Nick, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, yeah, they could be aligned. But what, because what we often do, and what I've done myself when I did a modulation, mod, mod, uh, was part of a modularization project, I just mentioned uh, middleware platform, which had this terrible DDD implementation, it was the divide and rule approach. I don't like the term because you missed, again, made metaphors are not covering what's really happening. You don't divide and everything is happy chappy. When you divide and rule, you put people against each other. That team, should, you make sure that those teams are not happy, then you rule. Right? So it's a divide and conquer. So that's just nice, it's a bad term. That's uh, Alexander the Great, by the way. <clears throat> so what we normally do when we... As the, well, uh, not normally, I, I've seen this a lot though. I'm not saying everybody does this, but they break things about without any plan or any oversight or any holistic approach. So it's like breaking a glass, you take bits there and bits there and bits there, bits there, and they are shards and they cut yourself and, and it's bad. And we missed the whole bit that the abstraction should synthesize, they shouldn't be random. They should be a, you should have some uh, higher thoughts when you create abstractions. And we're back to uh, system thinking here. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Here you're just focusing on the parts. You're actually ignoring the interaction. That's, oh, I have to talk to the other service. Hmm. How should I do that? Hmm. Damn, that doesn't work. OK, we have to share data then, because I can't ask him all the time, because hmm. right. you've seen that, probably. So how about doing a, another approach, which is the capabilities? You start with a high-level picture and break it down. And at least you know then, then that those should be stable. They should be self-contained. So they could be a great way to organize this, yeah, yeah, your system. I'm not saying this as I started with, it's not necessarily the only way to do it. There are a lot of ways to find a perfect future. Also with organizations, as Nick has said, the social, technical, and design patterns, there are could different reasons why you should why you would organize that way or why you shouldn't. For example, strategies or, you know, I mean, yeah, there's a, there could be other factors here, but this could be one of them. But another tool in the toolbox, if you like. So um, I think that as with DDD, uh, business capability mapness and service-oriented architecture in general is one way to guide you to create a sustainable IT system. This is from also Norway, by the way. <laughs> Been very nationalistic, but this is from the Nidaros Dome in Trondheim. If you ever get there, it's a beautiful bit. Yeah. So let's summarize. I guess the summary is in the title still, but so the. The capacity or the capability is for uh, the capability or the capacity for a business to do uh, to have a specific out business out outcome. That's what a business capability is. It's f and it's important that you focus on the what because it's, this is not how you do it. And it's also it's uh, you can and, and a good heuristic could be how would you imagine this looking from the outside? How would the company appear to somebody on the outside? What does the company do? What is it capable of, right? Um, as I said, this takes some effort, at least if you're going to do the full top-down approach. Um, I'm sure many of you wouldn't want to be in a workshop with CEOs, but um, CCC-level people, but that's one way to do it. But I still think it's a really good heuristic. Try to picture yourself. How would this capability model look for my, or at least how would my, the way I work, how would that capability look? How would I break that further now? Because that would belong to a whole, most likely. Or could be. So, I'm not sure, but I, um, this has been a really good tool for me, at least. And I hope uh, you probably learned something today. Does it get any, is it more clear what a business capability is? Hands, raise of hands. If you don't, I take questions now. Yes, please. Forgive me because you already uh, addressed it in your talk, but I would still be interested in how you um, would frame the relationship of business process and business capability. Yeah. Maybe in one sentence. 
Uh, one sentence more, that's a good one. Um, uh, I'd uh, actually like skip that bit because um, uh, are you familiar with value chains, value chain analysis? Yeah, uh, from the top level, you often do that. You say that a business has you have some materials that comes in, you produce something, and some output product. That's a classical value chain, right? Um, for an IT system, it's you don't necessarily produce a product. You often produce a service that somebody uses, right? Uh, uh, for example, from from the uh, from the um, uh, ISPs uh, perspective, perspective, you get access to the internet. For example, it's a service that they provide. So that is a high-level process, right? That cuts across these business capabilities. But there are workflows within those, right? Sell. How does the sale process works? That doesn't cross across the rest of the business capability. That is something that belongs within sales. Right? Uh, see if I got another example. Where? A web can use. <sighs> okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, well. Oh man. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, this one because this is the freshest one in in my head. Right. You have sales there, so you have outgoing sales. Has a specific process, right? Uh, the classical CRM approach, uh, where the salesperson sits with these opportunities, leads, and creates opportunities, and creates contracts, and then pass it off to some product uh, system or whatever. Incoming sales, a different approach. Incoming sales here is like self-service. When the people, when your customer goes on the website and orders something, the classical basket, mm -hmm, that's incoming sales. Different process. Right. Mm -hmm. So these are all belongs into different capabilities, and they are not connected. You will never connect those two processes. They are very different. Actually, it came up. <laughs> um, uh, the company I'm working at now, it came up that they wanted uh, the customers on the customer website should get the same uh, offers that the outgoing salespeople deliver to their customers. And then you're starting to blur on this. And this is probably where... Where, where, where you may be capable, it's not. You, you need to be aware that it could break at some point. It doesn't necessarily work. For your strategy, that could be different. But here, as it is now, it works. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Anyone else? Feel free, because um, as I said, I spent years trying to get this. And I don't think I've completely grasped it even, but um, I have at least an hypothesis now, and I would love to discuss it with anybody later on. If you have ideas and comments. More questions? Okay. Then I think that's it. Thank you.